Let's pray. As we pray, I'm asking you to think where you are, approaching God's throne, Jesus, our King, as we are all filled with His Spirit. We come to worship Him. Focus your minds on the great shepherd, Jesus, our leader. Lord, we struggle. We struggle to live under your leadership every day. So for a moment, Father, we just, we just want to sit. And we want to dwell in your presence. With our minds focused on you, Jesus, our Lord. And think about what you mean to us. So many ways we're pulled in this world. So many forces are fighting control of our lives to direct us. But here in this place, Father, in this moment, in this time, right now, we declare that You own us. We are Yours. And we want to live under the leadership of Your Son each and every day. And as we look upon Him, help us see a Lord a shepherd, a guide, an owner, a king that is fairer than 10,000 strong, that is more beautiful beyond any comparison or description, that is so filled with grace and mercy that would lay down His life before we were even born. He wore a crown of thorns. So powerful to overcome death so that we might experience a resurrection from a life that is dead in sin under the care of an owner who could care less. Father, we want to put our hands, our hearts, our minds, our lives completely in Your trust and care. Help us to do that. As we fix our eyes upon Jesus, in whose name we do pray. Amen. I would that we could all stand proudly and boastfully proclaim, you want to know who my shepherd is? You want to know who my Lord is? You want to know who my leader is, my guide? You want to know whose leadership I strive to live every day of my life under Jesus. For He is my shepherd. And He leads me in such a way where I find total satisfaction and contentment within Him to the point where I don't have to search for it anywhere else. Among the many things we search for in this life is time to relax and rest. Right? Or at least maybe we want it, but we don't search for it. We plan vacations to escape our hectic schedules. We look forward to time where we can get off and we can relax and be refreshed and rejuvenated. Because it's something that we need, right? The world throws so many things at us. We get beat down. We need the rest and the refreshment, and the rejuvenation, and the peace in order to help refocus our hearts and our minds. Well, it's interesting to note that Psalm 23 is referred to by some and can be looked upon as a psalm of rest. But here's the thing. David isn't talking about a peace or a rest that comes through a vacation that escapes life. 
He's talking about a peace and a rest that comes in the midst of uncertainty and the chaos. And it's a rest that David says can only come and can only be provided through the efforts of, he says, my shepherd. You want to know who it is? The Lord. Notice what he says in saying, the Lord, he is my shepherd. I will lack nothing. He says this, he makes Verse 2 of Psalm 23, he makes me lie down. And I love the picture that is painted here because it's not just, and you got to think about this. If, if you're trying to take an animal, make an animal lie down, oftentimes you have to force it, right? But the picture, the word that is used here in the Hebrew is the idea of laying down stretched out. How oftentimes I have this, oh, I should have, I should have had a picture of it. <laughs> I have a dog, his name is T-Bone. Still looking for pork chop. <laughs> and when he is relaxed, he bears it all. <laughs> Sometimes too proudly. He is all over the place, stretched out, and he is on each. It's great. It's all, I absolutely, absolutely love it. And that's the picture here of a, a sheep laying just sprawled out, relaxed. And rest it. In fact, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scripture done towards a couple of centuries before Jesus was actually born into this world, they use an interesting word. And it's a word in the Greek that means to pitch a tent. And so what happens whenever you're camping or you're looking for a place, right, to spend the night? What are you looking for? Things where it's adequate, whatever it is, whether it's trees, water, whatever it is, a space that is adequate enough for you to lay your head down and rest, where you're, you're, you're least concerned, right, about animals. You're, you're not concerned about not being protected or being aware or being alert or having the things that you need. The psalmist says, he makes me lie down, stretch out and rest. And he says, green pastures. It's interesting because the Greek word used in Septuagint here literally means young foliage and it's translated tender shoots. And so it's not long grass, it's small shoots of grass where it is going to be comfortable, but we'll get to that here a little bit later on because there's more to that word than meets the eye. So he makes me sprawl out in green pastures and he leads me beside still water. Some of your translations say quiet Waters. Literally, the Hebrew word means a resting place or a place of rest. The, trans, the Septuagint translates this. He leads me at the waters or to the waters of rest. And the word that is used there has to do with rest and recreation. It has to do with an intermission. That is a timeout, right? In the midst of busyness, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of our busy schedules and the hectic things that happen in hectic circumstances, there is a time out. That's the picture here. It's like this place that he's led to is a place of tranquility, of quiet, rest, and peace. It is an intermission. It is a time out from things. Now listen to this. David is boasting about the peace that he has, that he experiences as a result of who his shepherd is. Remember now, David is a shepherd, and he understands what it means to be a shepherd. And what you may not realize is that many of the things that David mentions here in Psalm 23 would have been very, very difficult, if not times, sometimes, or most of the time, impossible, especially in the area or the, the, the region in which David <laughs> lived. It was a very difficult thing to accomplish the things that David mentions here that his shepherd accomplishes. And so it's interesting, it's like as if David is saying, these things are difficult for us as shepherds to do, but I'm telling you there's a shepherd who can accomplish the impossible, and he is the Lord. He is able to do the very things that we struggle to do as shepherds. But he's also writing this from the perspective of one who is a sheep as well. Again, this may seem very difficult to accomplish, he says, but with the Lord, all things are possible now, David actually speaks into the difficulties that shepherds have in tending to their flocks, in tending to their sheep that only, he says, the shepherd can accomplish. Now, 
here's the thing. Here's why we say it's very difficult for some of these things to happen. Sheep are very timid. And to get them to lie down and to sprawl out and rest and come to this place where there's this intermission in between all the chaos and the uncertainty is a very difficult thing. And certain things had to be accomplished. Now, I'm not a shepherd. I'm not a herdsman. The closest thing I've come to herding is children. And that's it. So it was imperative for me to speak to and talk to or to read from, find out what it was like to be a shepherd. What it's like to be a herdsman because I have no clue. And so what I did was I got information from some shepherd who is actually a shepherd in East Africa region area, which is very similar to the land and area in which David would have been herding his sheep. And so I'm going to mention to you some things that had to have been accomplished by the shepherd in order in order for sheep to experience a rest and a relaxation that was a very difficult thing to do. Now, as I read these off to you, it is imperative that you see yourself if you are in any of these things. It is, it is imperative. Things that have to happen have to be accomplished in order for sheep to lie down. They will not lie down unless they are free from all fear. Free from all fear. Sheep are so easily, this is what they say, easily panicked that even a stray jackrabbit appearing suddenly from behind a bush can cause a stampede. One sheep is startled and runs in fright and others will blindly run after him, not even thinking, what's he running for? They will just take off. They have this mob mentality. One runs, oh, it must be ultimate danger. We're all going to die. It's the apocalypse. And so they all take off and they all run. And it could have been a grasshopper. <laughs> One of the shepherds said, he mentions the time when he had a friend. He came and visited him and he brought along, the friend brought along a small dog. And one look at this unexpected dog from his sheep. There were over 200 sheep lying down. In a, and it was an actual green pasture. Okay, so this is like in an area that's not, it's, it's not the desert. This is what we would think of when we see green pastures, which is not necessarily what David was talking about here. However, they were literally lying down. And one look at this unexpected small little dog. You know what happened? They took off running down the field. Had no clue. They were a distance from this dog. They saw him in the field. He's not supposed to be there. And they took off, they took off running. They were all, <laughs> and in, but here's the thing. In the course of time, as he dealt with his sheep, one thing that he came to realize is that nothing so quieted and reassured the sheep as to see him in the field. The presence of the shepherd put them at ease like nothing else could. And so as his sheep would get stirred up, and he would be aware, he would come into the field, and all of a sudden the sheep would all calm down. Peace would be restored just by seeing the shepherd, just by knowing the shepherd and being assured and trusting in the shepherd. I wonder how many times in our lives we are overcome by fear of the unknown and the uncertainty. Sometimes fear that is only coming from the mouth of one or two or three people. How many times have you been guilty of saying, everybody, when it's just one body? How many times have we been consumed with fear to the point where it causes us to react in such a way that it is not Christ-like, and it does not shine light, but rather darkness, and it exposes, exposes the black things in our hearts? Fear has a power to overcome and destroy and consume and utterly obliterate us as bearers of light. So it is imperative that in this world, which is filled with fears, and look, all you have to do is turn the TV on. Like, the news, I am convinced now that the news makes their money off of fear. Now, I'm not saying that the things that they're talking about and they're saying aren't realities. 
But here's the thing. There's nothing new. Jesus said there will always be wars and rumors of wars. It's a broken world. It's where we live. We should be used to it by now. But here's the thing. When we see the pressures and when we see the fears creeping in upon our pastures, right? Creeping in upon our lives. That's when it begins to affect us. Because before then, think about it. It's just something happening over there. But then when we begin to see, we think at least we see some things approaching us that we've never seen before, but yet oftentimes they've always been there. What's the difference? Well, I suggest as Christians it's because we took in our eyes off the shepherd and we begin to place them and put them onto the sheep. Did somebody wear my earpiece last night? I keeps wanting to pop off my ear. My ears didn't shrink any. You get the point. In moments of fear and uncertainty, if we cast our eyes upon the shepherd, remembering that he is always there with us, we can experience a sense of peace and rest in the midst of uncertainty. And so in order for sheep to lie down, they have to be free from all fear. Number two, they have to be free from all friction with other sheep. Within a flock, there is an established order of dominance. Generally, from the information I received, an arrogant, cunning, and domineering older lamb or, or excuse me, sheep or ram will be the boss. They maintain their position through budding and driving other sheep from the best grazing or the best grounds to lie down or rest upon the shade spots. Other sheep have their place as well, and they maintain their position through the same taxes. And so you have a pecking order. That's, that's chickens, but this is sheep. And so you have a butting order, okay? You have those who are domineering, and then you have the other ones. They know their place, and they strive to maintain their place through the same, through the same tactics, all this tends to cause friction, and sheep cannot lie down and rest, but always stand thinking that they have to defend their rights. Got the irony. There's a reason why we're called sheep. There's a reason why we're called. A shepherd said this. He notices when there is a, this sort of tension, his sheep become edgy, tense, discontented, and restless. They lose weight, and they become irritable, Interesting noting that whenever he came into view and his presence attracted their attention, the sheep quickly forgot their foolish rivalries <laughs> and they stopped their fighting. The shepherd's presence made all the difference in their behavior. And I think if we would consider the circumstances in which we find ourselves sometimes bickering and fighting and complaining and murmuring, whether it is in the home, whether it is at the workplaces and school, whether it is in the church, the body of Christ, if we would remind ourselves that we are in the presence of the great good shepherd, if we would take for a moment our eyes off of our desire, our feelings of needing to defend, as it were, defend our rights and begin to look upon the needs of others as the shepherd does. Something tells me that all the rivalries and things that irritate us will disappear. Oh, and they'll pop back up, no doubt. But if we keep our eyes on the shepherd and has the power to remove all these behaviors, the friction that we feel amongst ourselves. Number next, in order for sheep to lie down, if they're tormented by flies or parasites, they will not lie down and relax. Quite the opposite, right? Because we want to go to bed if we're feeling sick. But they will not. Especially during the summer months, they can be constantly molested by various types of flies and ticks. And it is impossible for them to relax and find peace in order to lie down. Instead, they're always on their feet, stomping their legs and shaking their heads. And only the shepherd can help ease or remove these annoyances. I wonder how many things irritate us or get under our skin or annoy us. I, I like what Nolan said in his prayer as he mentioned to God helping us to 
do away with and overcome our feelings concerning what we like and what we don't like. Now, feelings are very powerful and not a force to be played with. It is a force to be reckoned with. However, we have to fight our, with our own feelings that we're consumed with. And then those feelings, they spill over into the lives of others around us. And they too must contend with those feelings and emotions as a result of things that irritate us, get on our nerves, get under our skin. What's interesting about that is in the New Testament, there is a depiction of getting inside the skin of another, but it's not to irritate. It's to help see things from their perspective. I think that if we will as sheep look to the shepherd to help ease and remove the annoyances, then we will realize what the bigger picture is and what really truly is important. But hey, flies and parasites can be annoying. Number next, if they feel a need of food, they will not lie down. Now here's the interesting thing. In Palestine where David wrote this psalm, it's dry, brown, sunburnt, wasteland. This idea of green pastures are nothing more than these sprouts of grass that grow up here and there, strung along rocks and other places where when it actually does rain, water collects and it actually grows. doesn't really set much roots in there, but it actually grows. And so in some places, green pastures, it's not, well, we don't have green pastures, but it's not like as if those fields were, those fields were completely green. When he says green pastures, that's not what he, that's not what he experiences. That's not what he sees. And in fact, that's why the shepherds oftentimes have to lead the sheep to other places to graze. They have to follow the seasons as they climb up in elevation and they return back down. And oftentimes this is done in the midst of chaos and uncertainty, not knowing if there is going to be enough food. And the shepherd has to actually go out and search for the best places and has to come accustomed to knowing where to go and what times to go so he can get adequate enough food for his sheep. And so green pastures is not necessarily green pastures like we think of green pastures. Is sparse in many places. And green is really brown. Not a whole lot there. And so in Palestine, where he wrote this green pastures, it was a dream. It was like a dream. The Lord can lead me to green pastures where I can just lay out, sprawled out, and rest. And in some places, green pastures, especially even in that area where seasonal phenomenon, fields and even parts in the desert would green during the winter and spring, but during the summer and fall, they would have to be led to many different places in search of food. Again, only the shepherd could lead and provide this food, help them find these areas. Only one who can relieve all of these anxieties is the shepherd. It is did you see how a shepherd would be worn out and tired? It is nonstop, ongoing, always issues, always dealing with sheep. Restless, constantly searching, but never satisfied. Does that ring a bell or sound like us at all? The psalmist also says he is led beside still waters or he is led to places of rest. Here's the thing. When sheep, they tell me this, when sheep become thirsty, they become restless and set out in search of water. That's a bad idea, okay? Their sources of water typically come from dew on the grass, from wells or springs and streams. And so still waters isn't always the idea of water that isn't moving. In fact, it could be a fast running stream, especially if you're on top of the mountain and the snow is melting and the stream is fast. But here's the thing. They can walk and rest along these fast streams as if they were still and quiet because of the shepherd's efforts. If not led to good water, here's the thing. They will drink from polluted water filled with parasites and other disease germs. However, being led beside still waters, here's the thing, is not just about drinking water. It's not about whether the water is rushing, rushing stream or a calm 
oasis. Oasis. It's indicative of a place where we can find complete rest and relaxation amidst the chaos and the uncertainty that is experienced in the world. Now, the chaos and uncertainty for sheep would be, or the predators. Where are we traveling? Where are we going? Where's the shepherd? Where's the food? Where's the water? Why are these flies bugging me? And on and on and on we go. Here's the thing. David says, in the midst of the uncertainty and the chaos of this life, we don't just have to take a vacation. And those are good and those are fun. And I'm not opposed to vacations. So don't Twitter and tweet and whatever else you do. My preacher's against vacations. I wish I could have one right now. Vacations are important. They are fun. If for no other reason, to go off and have fun. And then you come back and you want a vacation from your vacation. That's not rest. (laughs) David says, in the midst of this chaos and uncertainty, we can have an intermission. (laughs) We can have a timeout. And we can sprawl out and rest and relax and be rejuvenated and Refresh. Notice this. Jesus calls us all to him to experience this rest. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 29, when he says, I will give you rest, is the same Greek word that is used to translate what David says in Psalm 23. Remembering this. With sheep, the presence of the shepherd is all it took to remove the fear take care of the anxieties. There is no substitute for the keen awareness of the fact that Jesus is here with us and in our midst every day. There's no substitute for that. None whatsoever. And so we it makes no sense for us, but we do it to search. To search in other places and other things to bring us this rest This peace in times of uncertainty. There is nothing, nothing that is better than a keen awareness of the fact that He is with us. He is there for us. And being aware of His presence has the power to remove all fear, remove all panic, and all anxiety of the unknown. Now here's the point you need to listen to. The Apostle Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy. And Timothy was feeling really weighted down by life circumstances. Not just ministry. There was no separation between ministry and life. The circumstances that were taking place in the social culture around him had a direct impact upon the life of the church. And Timothy is struggling. And he's feeling really weighed down. And his spiritual mentor on top of all this was awaiting execution in Rome. Opposition was mounting in Ephesus. There's more persecution looming on the horizon. And Paul reminds him that the spirit given him does not result in fear, but results in love and power and self-control. And it is the same spirit that we have that reminds us of his presence. Unless we grieve it, Ephesians 4.30, and we quench it. 1 Thessalonians 5.19. We have been given something that helps remind us of the presence of Jesus, that alerts us and helps us become keenly aware of the fact that He is with us every step we take. And that power has been given to us. But we can quench it and grieve it by the way that we live our lives lives, by the decisions and the choices that we make. So the question is, how do we remember that Jesus is always with us? What can we do to help our eyes stay focused on him? How, and I'm telling you, in these efforts, it combats us grieving and quenching the spirit. You don't believe me, you you can read the text, I didn't come up with this. Last week we talked about sheep. A shepherd gave an account of, of a rancher next to him and how his sheep were always just, they were scraggly, they were sick. He just looked at them as something to slaughter. He didn't care if they needed water, if they needed food. 
food, and they were always at the fence looking out in at the green pastures, wanting to know what was it like over there. And remember how we compared that to the things that control us. That was an owner who could care less about his sheep. That's not who David had in mind. David says, you want to know who my shepherd is? The Lord. And I'm completely content and satisfied with him. And let me tell you why. This is where he leads me. This is what he does. This is his guidance. As opposed to a shepherd or something that can own us, control our lives, that could care less. The sheep and the pen, always looking for something more. That sheep, that's us who are owned by sin, who are being managed by our fleshly lusts and desires, by the liar of this world who could care less. All he wants to do is keep us there. The question is, how in the world did we get there in the first place? A choice was made. Oftentimes, as James says, we are enticed by the things that he lays out before us. And then when we consume, we are still left empty. One of the ways that we're enticed, I I gave you an example of myself because I've experienced what that's like to be over there. Very early on in my high school years, there was a guy, and I won't say his name, he is deceased now. He tried his hardest. And my locker was right below his locker. And y'all still have lockers in high school? Okay. Things change, man. I don't know if they know what I'm talking about, but he had a locker above mine, and I sat in, in math, it was algebra or something like that, I can't remember. And he was always, he, he was known as one of the biggest drug dealers. He threw the biggest parties, and he was always trying to, and this is when I was a good boy, he was always trying to entice me to partake of the goods that he had. And he would say things like, come on, just try it. Just, just try it, and you'll see. He could not explain to me necessarily how it would make me feel. And all he could do was say, just try it. Just, just try it. You could just, just, just find out, just take it, and let's see what happens. Well, I want to flip that around. You want to know what it's going to take to become keenly aware of Jesus' presence every day? We have to spend time with Jesus. And the things that I'm going to suggest to you right now are things that all I can tell you is you just have to try it. You just have to try it. We can talk about my experiences all day long, but I'm telling you, you have to. You just have to try it and see. Just partake of the thing that I'm telling you will leave you satisfied. And that's all you have to do. You don't don't have to mock it. You don't have to beat against a brick wall. Just, Just try it. So how do we remember that Jesus is always there with us? Just try it. Just give it a shot. You have to spend time with him reading and thinking and focusing and meditating and praying and praising. Yes, every day. All day, various times of the day. Remembering, remembering to do this is easy for some, though, and more difficult for others. And so if you find this a very difficult thing to put into practice, and we've talked about this lots, you have to create a rule. Oh, we're jumping into legalism now. No, <laughs> this is your life. This is about you creating a structure and a framework that helps create habits that brings you to a certain place where you begin to understand and you gain the wisdom, the wisdom that says, ah, I see. I understand why people do this. I get it now. And so you have, you have to create a rule or a framework. And here's the thing. You have to create non-negotiable specific times. If you're having a difficult time throughout the day, just at various times throughout the day or at any time, Spending time with Jesus, you need to set non-negotiable times to where it could be just you and you alone. And that could be in the car on the way to work. Some of you, some of you do that. Okay, that, that, that could be in the morning, some of you after your coffee. 
Don't try before, you will fall asleep. Maybe it's after coffee, maybe it's during your lunchtime, some in the quiet of the night, whatever it is, you have to think about your day and when can you set aside specific non-negotiable. You get that? Non-negotiable. How many things in this world do we say are non-negotiable with our time? Things that don't actually matter in the end. Does it make sense for us not to set this as a precedent, as something that is non-negotiable in our life? I have people all the time tell me, asking me, how does, how does this work? And why do, I tell people, you have to first, you have to just try it. You have to give it a shot. I can't explain to you in words the things that you can experience in deeds. You have to give it a shot. Non-negotiable. Do whatever it takes to create consistency. Remembering not just, it's not something just to check off. But you have to look at this as a sacred, yes, look at it as a sacred, special time that you spend with Jesus. And then what about remembering amidst the chaos, right? Like, okay, so I want to do that, but one of the things that keeps me from being able to do that is my life is in turmoil. My life is in chaos. Things are happening all around me all of the time. Let me tell you what I used to do. I used to carry, I wasn't always a preacher. Well, I didn't always get paid to be a preacher, I used to be a welder, and what I did was I carried a New Testament around in my back pocket. Working in the oil, anybody work in the oil business in here? Working in the oil business is, is not fun. It is toxic. It is like the devil's playground. It is filled with wickedness and ungodliness. Now, there are some godly people in the, in the oil field. Praise God for them. But it is a nasty and a filthy place to be based on my own experiences. And so what I did was I used to keep a New Testament in my back pocket. And that reminded me of whose presence I was in and who I was actually working for. And then there was a non-negotiable time during lunch where I would separate myself from all the co-workers that I had to work with. And I would read Testaments. I would read things from the Psalms. The good songs. Some of the songs were depressing, but I would read the good stuff. Maybe that's something that you can do. Grabbing yourself a prayer bracelet. I told you guys about mine. It reminds me that who I'm with and who I am. And it also, I like doing this. I like to follow. This isn't a rosary, but so what if it was? I like to follow it. And with all these beads, give God thanks for something. And each bead represents something I'm thankful for or someone that I want to pray for or some sin that I need forgiveness for. Maybe it's a cross that you carry or hang around your, 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 your neck that reminds you, reminds you whose presence you are in. Something specific, that's the thing though. Don't just go up and pick up some jewelry or something nonchalantly, no. You make a conscious decision, whatever it is that you need to remind yourself. Something physical, yes, something tangible. It's not an idol. It's something that reminds you of whose you are and reminds you who to go to and whose, whose presence you're in. If you pick something, it needs to be very specific for you. Give it meaning. Choose it for a specific reason to help remind you, not just because it looks pretty. And now here's the deal. Through all these habits... The point is, we create a keen sense of awareness that could stay with us. Would you agree that the world throws tons of things at you? Tries to pull you in different directions. Tries to make you forget whose you are. Who actually leads you every day or who wants to lead you every day. Who can bring you to quiet, restful, peaceful places in the midst of chaos. These habits can help create a sense of that awareness that stays with us. Now, here's the thing. If we keep our eyes focused on Him, our lives revolving around Him, we will find and see green pastures and quiet waters of rest wherever we are. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for The words of David. We're thankful that we could be here today and we could sit 
in your presence and that we can focus our hearts and minds on you so that we can get a glimpse of what it could be like every day of our lives. Father, as we're on this journey, help us to seek wisdom and understanding and to seek, Father, what it's like to live under the care and the compassion of our Savior. And in the midst of chaos, turmoil, and uncertainty, help us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus so that we can find that place of rest and in tranquility. That green pastures and waters of rest will follow us, will find us, will be wherever, wherever we are. Lord Jesus, you're fairest of all, of heaven and earth. Be with us. And we seek your presence every day. Spirit, guide and leave us. Forgive us for quenching and grieving. Help us to be consumed and led. Power that raised Jesus from the dead. In his name we pray. Amen. I pray that as you go forward this week, that amidst whatever it is that you're facing and dealing with, that you will seek his face and that you will experience a peace and uncertainty. And in doing so, those who are amidst the chaos will look to you and say, I want to be in that place. I want to tell you a quick story about someone who used to be here, Sue McDonald. She passed away a while back, and but here's a great testament to her life and the peace and uncertainty that she found in the peace that she found in the midst of uncertainty. There was a man who was searching for God, and he didn't know where to go or what he was looking for. But he told me, "I saw what was in her eyes, and that's what I want." And I said, "What she has is peace. She has peace." and rest in the midst of chaos and uncertainty. And that's what we are looking for. We have a great testament to that within this body. And so I pray that as you go forward throughout this week, that you will have that. If that's something you struggle with, if you have a need of prayer, if you need help in understanding what it is that you can do in specific times to help bring you in a keen awareness of Jesus, I will be up here. We'll have someone from our prayer ministry up here. I'm going to ask one of the shepherds to come up here as we dismiss so we can pray with you, speak to you, provide you whatever it is that you need. And so if that is a need that you have, please come and let us know. Otherwise, I pray that you have an amazing week of worship. We're dismissed. Thank you, guys.